Welcome to this time of worship at Christ Church, where we are building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. I'm Sean Lewis, and I serve as the creative arts pastor here for our church. I wanna thank you for being a part of this time of worship together. If you're new to our church or just getting to know our community, you can get better connected by texting hello to the number that you see on the screen. If you're a kid or youth, or you have a child or youth in your family, you can get them connected to everything that God is doing in the, life, in the life of our church, in the kids and the youth ministry, by finding information on their websites. Also on the church website, you can find information about how to uh, submit your attendance today in worship, to submit prayer concerns for yourself, for your family, for others in your community, um, and also how to get connected to our online giving platform. Also on the website, we have information about the Bible adventure, this wonderful journey that we are taking as a church together in 2021 to read through the entirety of the Bible cover to cover this year together. And you can find information about how to get connected to Bible Adventure small groups, learn about our C3 weekly Bible Adventure conversations, and learn about what's coming up in our sermons uh, as we work through the entirety of Scripture together. It's so exciting, and I'm really glad and excited to be on this journey with you this year. We have another exciting opportunity coming up to uh, participate in some service from home with your family. Um, we're creating personal care kits for families in need in our community. All the instructions that you need to create these kits and learn how to submit them and learn what's, what you need to include in them uh, can be found on our church website at christumc.net slash missions. We are so grateful for this opportunity to worship together. And I pray that you have a blessed time of worship this morning.
Thank you for joining us in worship today. We are so grateful for all the ways God is leading us as Christ Church to connect, grow, and give. Thank you to each and every one of you who are faithfully mailing your tithes and offerings into the church or who continue to give through our secure online giving platform. You are making a difference. For those of you who want to start giving, you can access online giving by visiting the church website at ChristUMC.net. Your faithful support of Christ Church is meeting the needs and changing the lives of individuals and families throughout our church, our community, and our city. It is exciting to see Christ Church discover new and unique ways to live into our mission of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Remember, everything we have is a gift from God. May God continue to bless and multiply all of our gifts for the work of spreading that transforming love to the world. I also want to let you know and say thank you to everybody that helped us finish our year so strong for 2020. Next week, I'll be able to give you a complete update of where we were able to finish our year. But I just wanted to give you a heads up and say thank you for all those gifts that you have given to us to help us finish the year so strong. As we continue in worship this morning, I just want to take a second as we enter our time of prayer and address what happened over this past week. What went on in the nation's capital this past week is absolutely unacceptable. We need to speak out against any person or group that is causing violence and not recognizing or respecting our country or our laws. I recognize that not everyone in any protest is the cause of violence, but violence is not acceptable at any level or at any time. As a church, I invite you to join me in prayer for our country, for law enforcement, for innocent passersby, our elected officials, and any other people that were in harm's way. Please provide safety for those folks. I also invite you to pray for any person inciting or executing this violence, to be moved by God to have a change of heart and speak out against what is happening and respect the processes we already have in place. I also invite you to pray that as individuals and as a country, we can come together and begin the healing process that is so necessary in our world today. It is time for us to take responsibility for our actions and stop blaming others. I recognize and understand that sometimes there is blame to be given, but regardless of what anyone else says or does, we are responsible for our response and our actions, and we need to show everyone the love of Christ. This is not how anyone is supposed to act, and if we don't speak out against it, it will never change. If you're watching this this morning, I'm not sure what religion you are or if you're even a follower of Christ. But as a follower of Christ who set an example of what it means to love others, enough is enough. May the love of Christ change the hearts of all involved as we practice our call to love our neighbor as ourselves. Also, let me remind all of us who are followers of Christ, we are called to love others the way Christ did, and he was willing to die for everyone. Remember, you never look at a person Christ didn't die for. It is time for us to start acting that way. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray together. Lord, we lift up this country. We lift up this nation. We lift up all of the people that are involved as part of this country. We lift up our church. Give us guidance on the steps that we need to take to help bring about change. Lay out in front of us the steps we need to take to help people come together. Help us to treat others like you would treat others. Help us to stop placing blame. Help us to stop making judgments. Help us to live as you have called us to live, showing people the love of Christ. Not only in this situation, but in every situation. As we continue to work through the Bible as part of our Bible adventure, we ask that you would just open our hearts to the stories we read in Scripture. The stories give us so many insights on how we should act, how we should behave, 
and how we should live. When people ask, what should I do in the midst of this? I would remind them to remember what we have read and what we have talked about over the years. Our calling is to follow your example. Help us to live into that example and be an example for others so that together we can bring unity and make this world a place that people want to be a part of. Thank you for loving all of us, regardless of our background, and help us to show that love to others. We ask all this in your son's name, who taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to remind you, if you have any prayer requests that, that you would like lifted up by our intercessory prayer team, please go to our website, ChristUMC.net, uh, and click on the prayer button, and you can share those prayer requests with us. And also mark your attendance while you're there as well. And if any of you want to have a further discussion about what is going on in this world and, and the difference that we can make as a church, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, you can call me at the church office, 412-835-6621, or you can email me at cmorgan at christumc.net. May God continue to help us be an example to others in this world. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
Good morning. This morning, as we begin our uh, second week in our series, I want to share with you our scripture for this morning. It's taken from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. Hear these words. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford at the Jabbok. After he had set them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wretched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning and welcome back to week two of our Bible adventure. At this point, you're 10 days into the journey, which is awesome. Allow me to offer a word of encouragement for you at this point. If you miss a day of your reading, or if you're struggling with what you're reading, please know that you're not alone. And it's okay. Don't give up. The reading guides that that we have provided are there to encourage you, not to discourage you. So if you miss a day, don't panic. If you can make up the reading, that's great. If you can't, that's okay too. Just keep moving forward and don't forget to get plugged in to one of our Bible adventure groups for even more encouragement from others. You can go to ChristUMC.net slash Bible Adventure to sign up. Now, before I jump into this week's sermon, I want to just share a quick Bible adventure video with you. Now, don't worry, I'm no longer lost in the woods. Instead, this video is full of pictures of our children and confirmands picking up their Bibles to participate in our Bible adventure. Take a look.
awesome is that? It is exciting to see so many of our children and youth excited about reading through the Bible. Now, remember last week, I gave an overview uh, of the first 12 chapters of Genesis. And I reminded us that, that God's intended purpose for creation and for us is to live up to the goodness with which we were originally created. The stories of creation, the fall, the flood, and the dispersion of nations at, at Babel, that repeats a cyclical theme that will be repeated throughout the Bible. God calls us to our best selves. We obey for a season. We fall prey to sin and disobedience. And God works to redeem us and bring us back to reconciliation. Then that process happens again and again and again. The title for this week's sermon is The Roots of Our Family Tree. Now, how many of you realize that who we are and how we act is influenced by our family? This past Tuesday, I was watching This Is Us, which is a weekly TV show about three siblings and, and what goes on in their everyday lives. <clears throat> There's Kevin and Kate, who are twins, and Randall, who is adopted, but also born on the same day. Now, what makes This Is Us so interesting is that in every episode, there are flashbacks to when these three siblings were kids and, and how what happened to them then directly affects them now. In this week's episode, Randall, who is the adopted brother, finds out that his mother, who he thought died when he was born, actually didn't and just recently died, causing him to think that his birth father, who he had found a couple of years ago, lied to him which added more to his lack of self-esteem from being abandoned. However, at the end of the show, he finds out that his birth father actually didn't lie. He actually thought she did die giving birth, giving Randall hope that someone did actually care for him and didn't lie to him. And with the help of his therapist, Randall's working through his family history and the impact it has on his life. If we're honest with ourselves, our family history may have more of an impact on us than we realize. In fact, when the Bible uses the word family, it refers to our entire extended family over three to four generations. That means your family, in a biblical sense, includes all your brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-aunts, great-uncles, and significant others, going back to, say, the mid-1800s. And all of that could have an impact on our lives. I wonder how many of us know about our family over the last three or four generations. Now, while we're affected by powerful external events and circumstances through our earthly lives, our families are the most powerful group to which we will ever belong. Even those who leave home as young adults, determined to break free from their family histories, they soon find out that their family's way of doing life follows them wherever they go. As one expert puts it, what happens in one generation often repeats itself in the next. The consequences of actions and decisions taken in one generation affect those who follow. For this reason, it is common to observe certain patterns from one generation to the next, such as divorce, alcoholism, addictive behavior, sexual abuse, poor marriages, a uh, child running off, mistrust of authority, pregnancy out of wedlock, and the, the inability to, to, to sustain stable relationships. It's, it's one of the many reasons why it's so important to look at the hundreds of thousands of little stories that make up the entire Bible as one big story, because all those little stories can speak to us. Now, I've heard from several people over, over the last week to 10 days that said they're not really into the Old Testament because we should be followers of Jesus and, and he, he's in the New Testament. Well, they're partially right. Jesus is in the New Testament. But the stories we read in the Old Testament help us to understand the role history plays as part of the story. Much like I shared about our current family being affected by the last three or four generations, the same is true in the Bible. Now, before you think, I can never live up to the families in the Bible, allow me to share an overview of the rest of the book of Genesis as encouragement for us today. Guess what? There are no such things as perfect families in the Bible. In fact, most of Genesis is a scrapbook of dysfunctional family photographs. 
As much as the patriarchs and their families are esteemed for their heroic faithfulness, they all had their own issues. Let's take a look at some of these heroes and, and see what I mean. Noah was the second father of the human race, was on a boat with only family for several months and didn't go crazy, showed unbelievable obedience in building the ark, and when it was all over, was found drunk and naked by his three sons. Maybe it was because he was stuck with his family for several months. I don't know, but it's still kind of dysfunctional. And then we jump ahead to Abraham, who we are told had a faith that pleased God and was an ancestor of God's people, Israel, and was a successful businessman. And yet, when he was under direct pressure, he lied. At one point, he actually asked his wife to pretend to be his sister for his own safety. And then he tried to take matters into his own hands by sleeping with his wife's servant, Hagar, to try to have a son on his own instead of waiting for the son promised to him by God. How about his wife, Sarah? She was actually the first woman listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11 and is an ancestor of Jesus. But she offered her servant Hagar to Abraham because of her disbelief. And then she tried to cover her faults by blaming others. None of us ever do that, right? Blame someone else. And we can't forget about Hagar. She's the servant who Sarah gave to Abraham and had his first child, Ishmael, who became the founder of all the Arab nations. However, when problems came her way, she ran away and didn't face them. And she also thought of herself as better than Sarah because she couldn't have a child and Sarah to this point couldn't either. Then there's Isaac, the miracle son promised to Abraham and Sarah by God. Much like his father Abraham, he also asked his wife to pretend to be his sister for his own safety. He also played favorites between his sons and alienated his wife. <laughs> kind of sounds like a bad country song. And when we look at Isaac's wife, Rebecca, we see that she was a real go-getter. She took initiative in her life. The problem was her initiative wasn't always paired with wisdom. And she favored one of the sons over the other and helped to deceive Isaac. Kind of sounds like she should be on the real housewives of Canaan. Now, I hope you're starting to see a pattern here. Even the great heroes of the faith written about in Genesis had their fair share of issues. But don't lose hope. Because God is doing something in the midst of all of this. But first, let me share a few more examples. What about Jacob and Esau, the children of Isaac and Rebekah? Now, Esau, when faced with important decisions, tended to choose based on instant gratification instead of making wise choices, like selling his birthright for a bowl of soup because he was hungry. And we also find out his parents didn't like his choice of wives. And we can't forget about his brother, Jacob, who partnered with his mother, Rebecca, to deceive both Esau and Isaac and chose to take matters into his own hands instead of trusting in God. Now, I'm going to come back to this one because I think there's a lot we can learn from Jacob. My last example is Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob. Now, you may know Joseph's story, or at least some of it. You know, the coat of many colors guy who eventually became second in charge of all of Egypt. But don't forget, he was so arrogant as a kid that his brothers threw him in a well, sold him into slavery, and told their father Jacob that he was killed. Again, pretty dysfunctional. All these stories speak to our human condition today and offer a metaphorical reminder of God's relationship with God's people. Rather than placing our full trust and obedience in God, we often devolve into internal squabbling, self-preservation, and grudge holding. You see, it's not the noble qualities of these great families of faith that are most instructive to us. It's their failings. So we can learn from their mistakes and avoid them ourselves. We see in these stories that family patterns from the past are played out in present relationships without anyone necessarily even being aware of it. Someone may look like an individual that's acting alone, but they're really players in a larger family system that may go back, as the Bible says, three or four generations. 
It's true in the stories that we read in Genesis, and it's true today. Unfortunately, it's not possible to erase the negative effects of our history. Family history lives inside all of us, just like it did in the families of the heroes of faith that we read about in Genesis. The great news of Christianity is that our family of origin does not determine our future. God does. What has gone on before us is not our destiny. But we have to surrender control over to God. So let's jump back to Jacob and what I read earlier to see what I mean. In our text this morning, we find a man who is faced with many struggles as he he grew into the man God wanted him to be. According to scripture, Jacob struggled with his twin brother Esau while they were still in their mother's womb. And, and the record reflects that Jacob struggled all throughout his life. The reason Jacob struggled so much is that God had a purpose for his life. But Jacob wanted to be in control. Jacob was the third link in God's plan to start a nation from Abraham. However, Jacob being like so many of us, even though God had a divine purpose for his life, Jacob wanted to live independent of that purpose and live the way he wanted to. And like many of us, when faced with a struggle in life, he relied on his own resources and the help of his mother, (laughs) rather than going to God for help. However, we learn from Jacob's life that security does not lie in the accumulation of goods, but from leaning and depending on God. Another thing we also learn from studying Jacob's life is that anytime we try to live our life independent from the will of God, we're going to be faced with some major struggles. And in those struggles, we're going to find ourself to be all alone. However, if we're living according to God's purpose for our life, we will find that at the most difficult times in our life, the Lord will lift us up and carry us through. However, if we're going about things on our own, then we will feel all alone in our struggles. God's there, we just won't realize it. Nevertheless, we can be blessed in the midst of our struggles if we do what Jacob did in our text. The first thing we learn from Jacob is that he got real with God. Jacob was about to meet his brother Esau for the first time in 20 years, and he was struggling with fear because the last time he saw Esau, Esau was so mad he was ready to kill him. So Jacob got real with God. He was struggling with his fear. He was struggling with fear for his life because of his brother. And back in verses 11 and 12, he says, Oh Lord, please rescue me from my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he is coming to kill me along with my wives and children. However, you promised to treat me kindly and to multiply my descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. You see, when we're struggling... We need to get real with God. When we're struggling with a bad relationship, we need to get real with God and say, I've gotten myself into a bad relationship. Save me from it. If we're struggling with drugs and alcohol, we need to get real with God and say, I'm addicted to drugs and alcohol. Save me from it. If we're struggling with problems on our job, we need to get real with God and tell God what we're struggling with. If we're struggling with a disobedient child, Don't be afraid to get real with God and say, God, I can't do this without you. If you're struggling today about how to show love to people who who don't think like you, be real with God and say, God, I need your help to show them your love. When we get real with God, we come to the point that we can admit we have nowhere else to turn. We've come to the end of ourselves. I mean, look at the crisis that Jacob is facing here. On one side, Esau is closing in on him. On the other side stood the Lord. Jacob could go no further. It was the absolute end of the line. For 20 years, he had been able to bluff his way through. He had survived on clever cover-ups. But now, he's in a place where he couldn't go on, even one more day, as he had in the past. Jacob was forced to reveal his true self before the awesome presence of the Lord and see himself for what he really was. All night long, the battle raged. But this time, Jacob meant business. He wanted to be free. 
He wanted to look the Lord and the world in the eye and know he was honest and holy. He wanted deliverance. In verse 27, it says, the man that he was wrestling with asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Jacob knew his name stood for heel grabber, one who cheats his brother himself and tries to hide it from God's eyes. What the Lord was saying to him was, look at yourself, what you've become. No excuses now. For once in your life, face reality, face the truth, Be deadly honest, or there will be no victory. And out it all comes. Oh, Lord, I'm a phony. I'm so religious outwardly, but inwardly I'm a cheat. I'm a grabber. I've played with fire too long. I've been excusing my actions. I've been justifying my sins. Forgive me, Lord. You see, there can be no victory without facing the final deadline like Jacob did at Jabbok. We must face the reality that We're not anyone special. We're not immune to exposure and judgment. We must face the fact that God, with all love, must give us a deadline, a last chance to obey completely. Not that God's grace is ever withdrawn or or God's love and mercy are limited, but there comes a time when God can no longer hold back the wages of our sin. We must face the reality that we cannot go on living a lie. No matter how blessed we are, No matter what great things are accomplished in God's name, God will not permit an open-ended license to go on sinning. We must obey or be exposed and begin to reap what we have sown. At Jabbok, God delivers us from our provoking sins by changing our very character. In verse 28, it says, Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Prevailing power through a new character. Jacob knew it was in his power to obey because the Lord accepted his commitment to surrender. As we continue working through the Bible adventure, we need to realize the Lord is not interested simply in us getting victory over certain sins. God wants us to change into new people with pure hearts. We need a character change. That is how we can move forward in the direction God wants us to go. It took only one desperate night of facing the truth. One night of struggle with the old nature. Jacob had it out with the Lord and prevailed. The Lord saw his desperation and determination and touched him. He put his hip out of joint. As we have seen in the story of Jacob, and for that matter, the stories of other great heroes of faith that we have read about or will be reading about, one of the greatest miracles the Lord can perform on our behalf is to cripple all our human efforts and make us totally dependent on God. But in order for that to happen, we have to surrender control of our lives over to God. We must always keep in mind that we need supernatural help to sustain this commitment. Move past what has gone before and live into the destiny that God has for us, just like the heroes of faith did throughout Genesis. You see, in God's family, success is defined as being faithful to God's purpose and plan for our life, just like Jacob and the other faith heroes ultimately did. When we do that, everything else will be added to us and we too can become a hero of faith. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for the example that you've given us throughout Genesis, that in no way, shape, or form do you expect us to be perfect to be used by you. The greatest heroes of our faith were all part of dysfunctional families and made bad decisions, and yet you were able to use them to do great things. But they had to surrender to you. Help us to realize that we can't do anything on our own. We can't handle any situation under our own strength. We need to surrender control of our lives over to you. And then, and only then, will you equip us and give us the grace and the peace and the power that we need 
to make the right decision, to live as you have called us to live. And we too can become a hero of faith, just like all the examples we read about throughout the Bible. Thank you for the opportunity to be used by you. May we stop trying to run things ourselves and allow you to guide us where we need to go. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. We again want to thank all of you who have taken the time to mail your offering to the church and have started or continue to give with our secure online giving. Your generosity allows Christ Church to continue to provide ministry in new, unique, and exciting ways every day. If you haven't already, please be sure to go to ChristUMC.net and sign in using our attendance button. You can also share a prayer concern or give using those buttons on our homepage. Don't forget, 
You also can find more information out about the Bible Adventure on our website. We are excited to be reading through the Bible as a church during 2021. On our website, you can find the reading plan, both full and abbreviated, and you can also sign up and join a Bible Adventure small group to discuss what you're reading or what the sermon was discussing or what you see in C3. Thank you for all the ways that you have continued to live out your faith as we continue building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Please join me today in this affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord. To that end, that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. So glad you could join us today for worship. You know, as we continue to navigate 2021, as we continue to navigate through the Bible as part of the Bible adventure, as we realize what a difference our family of history or origin has on our current life, may we never forget that all of that pales in comparison to the plan you have in store for us. May we turn control of our lives over to you and allow you to lead us where you want us to go. And as we do that, we can make a difference in this world. We can help this world to change and we can become a hero of faith, just like those folks that we read about throughout Genesis. May God bless you this week. May you have a great week and may you keep up with your reading and continue to allow God to speak to you. Go in God's peace.
face 